Good morning. Greetings. How are you? I'm very well. And yourself? Good, good. I, I, it is on my schedule today at noon to get my first shot. Ah. Oh, you got your first shot coming. Not yet. I, I, I had a near miss incident yesterday. Um, so yesterday, April got her first shot and I went along not having an appointment or anything. I'm like, geez, like, the system has forgotten me because I typed myself in. And then I, as I'm waiting for April to get out of the observation period, a guy comes out and says, who here doesn't, you know, could use a shot. We have some, we may have some spare doses. And so I'm like, you know, hand up. And it turns out that seven of us outside uh, need one. And it turns out they appear to have seven doses left. So I'm like, Amazing. this is rocking. I'm going to get my shot now. I go in and they start to register us. And then I end up at a guy who's a newbie. Uh, he can't find me in the system, but then his supervisor can't find me in the system. So then he has to create my new record, blah, 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 blah. By which time I see all the other people standing in front of the other operators have gone around the corner to get their shots. And then as I go to the corner, the guy who brought us all in says, hold on a sec, let me check. And guess what? No more doses. Um, so then they so then they kindly made like a first next appointment for me, which is like today noon. That's great. Well, I, I'm fully vaxxed. Um, yeah, me too. We uh, I have a friend who works for Marin County Health Department, and she said, "If you want a shot, I can get you in." I said, "I don't want to jump the line. You know, there's people that need this before me." She said, "No, we have this list that we create." And if people don't show up, we don't waste any doses. So if I call you, it can be here in 15 minutes. And she called me at quarter of eight at night. And I'm like, I'm there. And I got awesome. That's right. So, yeah. 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 That's great. Like not wasting doses seems to be a good priority. I love that. So we had our first actual social weekend last weekend. We, we met with friends, all of them fully vaxxed outside. We were hugging. We were. Oh my God. It was like unbelievable. Oh, I remember hugging. Yeah, it's so, you know, it, it's really lovely to be able to get with your friends who have been vaccinated and, and you know, sit down and not be paranoid and, and hug each other and share a meal and laugh and talk. It was, it was almost like normal and very weird to be normal again. Yeah, I'm going to have to deprogram myself. I, I, so mid, mid lockdown, a couple of friends came through town and invited us to dinner, like outside, socially distance, whatever. And April was was busy and couldn't. But I went and joined them. And even as I was walking toward the dinner, I had weird things happening in my head and body. I was like, blah. And then I get there and we're sitting outside across the table from each other. And the first words out of their mouths are, oh, we just both got over COVID. I'm like, wish, wish you could have told me that a little earlier. <coughs> Hard enough that I'm sitting here psychologically dealing with, with like even sitting across the table from people who are not April, right? Uh, and we had a lovely time and I didn't catch COVID from them and all that. It was quite an adventure, but I was, uh, I, the, my equivalent here is I, I've, I've realized that I've started thinking about the world like Matt Damon on Mars, like the whole environment could kill you. You have to be really careful and protected like bubble boy as you go outside. And I'm like, wow, that's going to be really hard to hit undo on in my head later. Yeah. It's going to be a tough one. And you don't want to in some ways. I mean, if you can, wear a mask while inside a building, you should. I mean, it's partly because that's signaling to the rest of the world that they don't have to worry about you. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, the other option I think is we're gonna all spray paint a big V on our forehead. And because <laughs> otherwise, you know, people are gonna freak out. They're still oh, yeah. gonna, you know, you're not protecting me. You're not totally wearing true. <laughs> Totally true. Well, we're also not gonna get a clean end to this thing. It's There's not like one day where India, it's is, India is developing new variants as fast as Brazil is. Uh, we, um, I, I sorry to interrupt here, but I I, 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 I am really stressing out because we we have a major center for Carnegie in India in Delhi. Some of our most talented people working on technology, and India is just over the edge. I mean, they they uh, the the head of the center was using the word catastrophe. Um, uh, it's, I used it's, to have a van. It's war zone. Yeah, I mean, it really. Yeah. And 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 what's scary? The the FT did a article yesterday. They have a um, a data reporter who's extraordinary, and they're seeing ten times as many deaths as are being reported due to COVID by counting the the number of uh, people being cremated. Oh God. And so yeah. the, the, the number of cases is 314,000 just yesterday. 
Whoa. So two days as many as the US has had to date. Yeah. And the reports are 2,000 deaths, but it's more likely 10 to 20,000. And what's really sad is that the age distribution is getting younger. The people in the mm. hospital are younger, mm. which is apparently due to two things. The variant is more dangerous to younger people, the new variant, and the elderly are being triaged. I mean, they can't get beds at hospitals and often the dead, the, 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 you know, the 75 year old grandmother who gets COVID is assumed to be all but dead. Yeah. Right. And they're running and, out of oxygen and supplies and everything. Oh, it's, it's horrifying. And, it's, so, and the, it, it, the curve is going up steeper than anywhere else in the world. The Spanish flu killed 5% of the population of India. Wow. And I, they're not gonna be able to, even though they make a lot of the vaccines, I don't see how they're gonna get most of the people vaccinated. The Spanish flu killed 675,000 Americans, but the population was much smaller than, who, do, who knows the proportion? Three because to one. This, this, pardon? About three to one, I think. So the, no, what, no, what, what, what percentage of the US population was that? Well, back then the population was about oh. 70 or 80 million, I think. 70 or 80 million, okay. Yeah, uh, be, so was, be, because the Spanish flu destroyed American society and so much so that we didn't talk about it afterward. <clears throat> like nobody wanted to go back to those memories. And more Americans died from the Spanish flu than died in World War One, et cetera, right. et cetera. Uh, it was really traumatizing, and it, it shouldn't Probably be called. Because the, it should have been actually called the Kansas flu because it started yeah. at an army base in Kansas, and then we exported it. Yeah, we it's sent it with our go boys to Europe and blame and blame them. I have two questions. Why why is the India outbreak come so late in the whole game? It's like a year since you know we all started obsessing about this thing a little more than a year and second is what if we're not looking at a pandemic but at the beginning of a pandemic era so there's a lot of people who are saying that and the, just the fact is is we're interacting with animals so much more and there's so much more globalization and there there have been viruses and bacteria that can cause pac Pan pandemics popping up all over the place for years, but they've often been isolated in the jungle in Congo and people didn't travel. They, 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 they was, it was well, main, well, well constrained. So, but the, the so, reason so I've heard for India, question. India did a total lockdown. They, I mean, they really, they just, you know, they, they all the, they really, really, really reacted strongly and it, it completely disrupted their economy for about a month or so. And so the first wave was held down. The second thing is if the climate is such that you can do a lot of things outside. And the third is that like parts of East Asia, people often you know, hold a, a, a veil, a sari or something or, or, or wear a mask for other reasons. Mm -hmm. But, but what's happened in the last, I mean, a, a month ago, Mr. Modi stood up and said, well, India has conquered COVID. You know, we're back to normal. So all the sporting events, all of the 1,000 person weddings, everybody took the masks off. Ooh, yeah. wow. And just, it, it, wow. it was completely Trumpian. It was almost yeah. as bad as Bolsonaro. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so back to the other question, Mike, uh, it, it, you know, not will there be a pandemic here, it's like a fair chance of that, but what if there is? What if we are in you know, decades of cycling pandemics from various sources, years or decades? What happens in the world? What happens to society? You know, Jerry, you were talking about turning off switches in your head. Um, how, how will we encounter and deal with that? Anybody either thinking about that or seeing people who are thinking about that? Because I've, I've, I've heard one or two people, I think you're the second, I'm going to talk about that. I'm not, it's certainly not in the public discourse in any way, but what if this is the rest of our lives in some form? Is that a crazy question to ask? It's not a crazy question to ask. No, it's a all. sad question to ask. It's it's a sad question. Question. Take a look at uh, Vietnam, for example. I mean, they had virtually no death. I mean, it, it's less than a hundred so far. The last time I heard was like 20 some. They instantly mobilized the pandemic response plan 
they had put in place during the uh, SARS uh, the, the problem. Japan, uh, uh, I mean, in these countries, it's perfectly normal to wear a mask. Everybody runs around in the subway wearing a mask. I think we just have to adjust our behavior. And, that's, and when you look, for example, the flu, we had virtually no flu cases last year you know, because everybody's wearing a mask, so it didn't, it didn't get to spread. So yeah, I think it's part of the new normal. We just haven't cut on to it in the Western world. The Asians have been, because of their population density, have had far more experience with, with these pandemics. Guess how many Americans under the age of 12 died from the flu last in, in the last cycle? Is it zero? One. And that's yeah. a number, that's usually hundreds. Yeah. Or the, the flu has been wiped out by masking and by a bunch of other stuff. The flu, the flu numbers are way, way, way down. Yeah. But there's still oh. annual deaths, just that, mm -hmm. that it's, it's, been, it's normal. And, and COVID is not normal yet. Yeah. I mean, basically we, we, need a, we have immune systems inside our skin and then we have societal immune systems outside our skin. And some societies are better at the latter or so far have been and others are being hit hard. I mean, province of Ontario in Canada is having a similar experience on a lower scale than India, where suddenly uh, there, there was a notice sent out that if you don't have a 70% chance of surviving ICU, you're on your own, buddy. That's on province of Ontario. Wow. <clears throat> and how do they determine that? I mean, is it a sort of a 70%? checklist? Well, Morbidity is probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have to triage, basically. Mm -hmm. well, well, come to that, they're, they're right at, at that edge now. I, I've read, and I don't recall the source, that uh, that people in that status have a very small chance of surviving, even in an ICU. Right. Uh, so, there's, so, so it's a triage of resources. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's cruel. It's not cruel. It's, you know, it's, it's tough. But there's, you know, if if the resources are scarce, you're not going to apply them to people who have no shot at surviving. Mm -hmm. But Doug, did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, uh, any kind of pandemic is now going to intersect with what's happening with climate change, which is going to make it very messy to follow what's happening. Oh, God, this climate change. <laughs> Say more about that. Well, uh, we're already getting uh, migrations and extreme weather events that are happening with climate change. And those are going to increase, which is going to make the uh, pandemics uh, look like just noise in the background. Yeah, I did a hearing for Gore back in 1990 called Climate Surprises. And the goal was to say, what are the follow on effects? You know, what's the Rube Goldberg chain of events that's going to cause really, really serious things we hadn't anticipated? And one of them was migration. So all these people are moving back and forth, homeless, and that, that makes it hard to control a pandemic. But the other one is that you don't have cold winters in parts of the Southern US. And so, you know, the Zika virus can start surviving. Uh, malaria starts showing up. I mean, it's really, it, 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 you just don't, you don't put all these pieces together because it's, you know, three steps removed. But sometimes those triggers lead to some really serious consequences. I was reading to an article about the greening the Sahara, the Sahel um, uh, movement. There's kind of a, people who are busy trying to figure out how to re-green the Sahel because it used to be green, and and we, we, you know humans have managed to desertify a lot of parts of the earth that didn't start that way. Uh, and what was interesting was uh, both from migratory birds. Uh, used to stop there, but there's nothing for them to stop there on anymore, but also that the weather patterns that were being interrupted by the, the desertification and, uh, and, and sort of pointing to different places on earth where suddenly, like, you know, the building, I'm remembering a little bit of it now, and this is kind of related, but the, the building of vacation homes on the, on the coast of Spain has caused larger flooding in Germany because weather that used to dump rain in Spain because it had picked up moisture from marshes and wetlands on the coasts of Spain, doesn't have those wetlands anymore, isn't picking up the humidity, so it travels further inland into Europe and causes you know, other kinds of patterns. And there's, there's lots of this going on and it's all, of course, complex, a word we're starting to hate love, I think. <clears throat>
Um, Something similar to what happened in Southeast Asia about 15 years ago when the uh, coastal waves were battering like Thailand. And uh, it turned out that because they cut down the mangroves to build vacation resorts, the mangroves had previously absorbed the energy of the waves. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. And the, the mangroves are also good tsunami defense, um, natural tsunami defense systems. Uh, so, so there's a lot of. I wish I were wearing my undo T-shirt. My favorite T-shirt has a big eraser on it with a with a command Z on it, like the undo key. And it's it feels to me like there's so much like undo we have to do. A lot of which is profitable. Like I don't think this is like we need to undo the economy. I think that we need to figure out how to get there. And I know that uh, Al Gore, when I got to hear him once in person, his first question was, "I don't understand why conservatives don't see." climate mitigation as a great new business opportunity. I don't understand why that idea doesn't creep inside their heads. Doug, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, it seems to me that the outcome of this is likely to be a move towards monopolization of big data, algorithms, Google, Amazon, uh, and governments to manage the world centrally uh, as a single. <laughs> Well, we're moving like uh, the big article in the Times a couple, yesterday, the day before, was that there seems to be a world, a global crackdown on the big tech companies, that that uh, there may be uniform regulations that take down the monopolists on big tech, which then, if we, list, if I, if we follow your thesis, means that either governments become the big data holders and monopolists thereof, or something else happens. And I, I don't know how that plays out. That, <clears throat> okay. that subject, <clears throat> there's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of um, uh, big, big tracking through our, through our, our smartphones and all that. Um, and there'll be uh, one month, uh, two month uh, production of, of vaccines. You know, they'll speed up the, radically speed up the vaccine process. They'll speed up the tracking process. Everybody will know where everybody is. And who, who who got near anybody else who had it? It's going to be a wild scene. It's going to be a wild scene. Um, uh, we may look back on the pandemic years as the good old days when things were relatively quiet, and partly enforced quiet because we were all driven inside and couldn't meet, but partly because all the complications that we're talking about right now hadn't sort of shown up and manifested themselves as fully as they may in the next decade or two. So thank you for all of you in this room who are trying to count, mitigate that and, and do good things to, to fix that. Um, let's go to a check-in round and I'll start with uh, Kevin, Judy, uh, Michael. Thanks. Uh, I've been working as people who are on this thing know, this thing called the Community Equity Fund, which is friends and family funding for black and brown entrepreneurs and business owners that don't have a rich uncle. So they can't get into the debt funds that are out there with community development finance. And uh, we've suddenly taken a, a massive step forward kind of crazily. Um, we've been adopted into our county's annual budget uh, at like 700,000, you know, five weeks ago, we were at 19,000. <clears> and the foundation that was going to give us you know, 125,000 is now saying, please take 260. And our metric is going to be really simple. You know, this 90% of black owned businesses are sole proprietors, but nobody focuses on them. In Charlotte, where it's 95% one employee uh, black owned business, there are three accelerators for startups and nothing for the 95% who've been around for two or three years and can't get into that system. And so we, our metric is going to be uh, how many sole proprietors become job creators and how many jobs and uh, what's the revenue and what's the increase in income. And because I, we're talking about this at a conference, uh, we're, uh, the UK is looking at it and we've written a piece that's being circulated in Parliament and in Downing Street. And they're looking at uh, possibly doing this at 2 billion pounds. And they're, uh, I can put that link up here too, but it's, it's a pretty interesting kind of thing. It, it's, it, 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 they, we figured out the kind of capital that they need. It's a mix of uh, philanthropic equity with revenue share. And partly it's not that we're geniuses, we've done it wrong two or three times. <clears throat> but the other thing is almost nobody's focusing on, you know, businesses that have 50,000 revenue. There's one employee that has, you know, there's no reason for a separate checkbook. So interesting stuff. Uh, it's kind of crazy how it's, you know, five weeks ago, we were at 19,000 and now we're above a million and they're talking about replicating it 2 billion. So anyway. Um, yeah. Judy, Judy, then I've got a, another question for Kevin. Yeah. yeah. A quick question. 
in terms of the the financial structure, legal structure that yeah. you're doing this under, are you using a 501c3 and a C-corp model or what are you doing? Yeah, we're, well, so I, I can go in, into it. I mean, we're using a uh, community development corporation, which is the 501c3. And we're partnering with uh, CDFIs, which get money from the Community Reinvestment Act to do the due diligence and uh, underwriting and that sort of thing. When we do it uh, through church congregations and we're doing it with kids, white kids learning with black kids about the problems and stuff, um, we're doing it through a donor advice fund to us. It just froze on us, Kevin. To us and to a community development corporation. Okay. What's that? I, it would be interesting to, to cover this offline as a podcast or something for people that are interested because yeah, I'm yeah. working with organizations that would be wanting to use it. Yeah, it's 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 pretty cool, and, and you know, by having everybody on a common accounting platform and helping them get there through a, a bookkeeping co-op, then we're also uh, instituting or getting them to be members of cooperative purchasing. So their cost of cell phone and electricity and uh, office supplies all go down through the collective, but tied to another collective, you know, a larger which, collective. Which actually brings me to my second question for you, Kevin, which is. Um, I just realized yesterday, browsing the intertubes, that you just finished the Shift conference. Um, yeah, right. And which, and I scrolled down, and I'm like, "Holy crap! How did I not? How did I not know about this?" I apologize that I didn't, you know, didn't wasn't in your audience, but it looked really awesome. Would you like to debrief a little bit for us? Yeah. Well, you know, one thing about it is uh, this was a. Uh, as I told people, I, I wasn't. It wasn't my conference, but I helped uh, helped it come along, uh, and uh, it was done by a guy who's a really good. Uh, virtual ticket monitor, uh, uh, the kind of thing, or marketer rather. And, you know, what I tell folks, you know, uh, is that SOCAP needed to be done by an entrepreneur because people didn't think there was a there there. And now that there is a there there, this is done as a federation with revenue share. And so, you know, Echoing Green and Village Capital and the Gin and all the big players were there, B-Labs and stuff uh, through revenue share. And so it's going to be interesting to see if conferences come back, if that kind of, uh, uh, federation and revenue share is uh, it was is what happened. So it, it was pretty interesting, and and we got some really I could go further into it, but some really cool things happen. I'm working with Andre Perry, with, whose book Know Your Price is I think really essential, and with the with the uh, Brookings in, Institute and with uh, Ashoka on looking at things that change market architecture. You know, there's a lot of folks who are saying, oh, here's a black fund manager, here's a black entrepreneur, but actually, you know, what can reverse redlining? You know, the architecture itself. I think that's people are ready for for a system change you know, rather than an anecdotal feature about a this or that, you know, uh, this entrepreneur and that. So I think, I think we, when we started SoCap, we enhanced the, the, uh, the ability of the existing market to uh, allow, you know, you to think like a philanthropist and act like an investor. And now we want to blow the fucker up. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's our simple goal. Um, thank you. Um, that's super interesting. And if there are some standout presenters or other people from the conference and, uh, Judy asked whether the conference is going to be posted to YouTube or whatever. Do you know? Yeah, it really soon. Uh, it, and there's some really good, good um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Andre Perry and Know Your Price. It's a fascinating book. He goes back and looks at his poor neighborhood. He, he grew up, you know, kind of in the hood and, and with a grandmother and passed around a bit. And, but he, he looks at his neighborhood both as a kid who grew up in the hood and as a Brookings scholar. Uh, and, and so it's this double lens thing. If anybody knows the book Maps and Dreams, uh, where it's, it's looking at uh, indigenous reparations in Canada uh, from an anthropological and, uh, and a, uh, a, a project planning standpoint, it's, it's that double lens of, of, a, of a scholar and an anthropological look at things. It's, I, I think it's, it's the best book around that kind of stuff. Wow. But there, I mean, there are a lot of other really good ones too. For sure. Devin, Thank you, Kevin. Would you be possibly interested? Let's talk offline, but I think this particular topic is worthy of Guild or Quest or whatever we want to call it within OGM, just to get people who are knowledgeable to share information with people who want to be knowledgeable. Yeah, yeah. With with our, the spin out of the Thriving Communities Fund, which is the stuff we do in, in persistent groups, uh, we just take philanthropy and we don't make people think differently on the front end. It's just that then the money's coming back and you have to think about what the heck to do with it, and the white folks aren't in charge. That, that's the thing that's kind of kind of cool about it. Love that. Yeah, Thank glad you. To. Thanks, Thanks Judy. That's yeah. an awesome awesome check in. Love that. It, it, um, yeah. Sometimes the lights all shine. 
Um, Judy Michael Julian. Oh, I'm up to my neck in all kinds of things. You are. But, but pretty much good things. Um, <clears throat> lots of work going on in OGM and I've been connecting with selected individuals who are interested in trans, I mean, we, we talked briefly about diversity issues and inclusion and opening, but, but the, we have to kind of start at the bottom. We have to infiltrate, and, and I don't wanna use the word infiltrate. We need to join and learn from all of the people who are not part of the group in order for them to be interested to join our group and bring their perspective to our table. But I think we need to learn their perspective first and gain trust. And so I'm infiltrating everything I can through any contacts that I have and sort of telling all the organizations I work with, look, we're looking at this upside down. We're looking at what can we do because we're established. We need to be looking at what do we need to understand about the groups that are not established or enabled such that we can help them. And then you build a relationship. So that's where all my energy is going, but it's on you know, local, state, and national levels, um, all in a sort of sub Rosa-ish kind of thing, because I'm just coming in as a catalytic question asker. That sounds great. Um, and in sort of general interest of that thing, um, I'm, I'm, I've been on a couple of events that Angel Acosta has hosted, and he's invited me in to be in one of his fellowship forums, the link I'm putting in our chat right now, and, and we're chatting on the matter most, uh, so we can preserve the chat between sessions. Um, and I was on uh, one of, I, I was on a, a, a recent fellowship forum session with uh, Michael Eric Dyson, which mm. was magical. It mm. was really amazing. And we, we get, we were already halfway into a really interesting session. And then Angel asks Michael, so talk about hip hop for a little bit. And it, what I don't know among the millions of things I don't know is that he's an authority in hip hop and he, he starts to recite sort of chat. He starts to quote different hip hop artists weaving them into uh, philosophic traditions and the topic at hand in the call in this beautiful, spontaneous way. And everybody's just starting to rock with the whole call. It was fabulous. It was really, really interesting. So uh, that set a really high bar, which I will probably not hit in my little fellowship forum, but uh, anybody who wants to join, uh, register for the, the event, it should be fun. And uh, <clears throat> Angel is, is sort of, uh, hosting a really beautiful group that, that cares a lot about mindfulness and uh, sort of compassion and a bunch of other things that don't get enough airtime uh, as we all figure our way forward to, uh, to some sorts of solutions and all these things. Um, so sorry, Judy, did you have anything else you wanted to check in on? No, uh, Kevin, are you willing to take calls and stuff? Was it, was it Kevin or Doug that I was talking to? I, mean, I think it was Kevin. Yeah, Kevin's gone. Okay, he had to drop off, yeah. Okay, um, I thought it was Kevin, but then I looked and he wasn't there and I thought, oh no, did I capture the wrong name? He was, a, he was a drop of water briefly and then he vanished. Uh, well, I, I would invite others in this room to think about the nascent capacity to form learning groups, not to, to necessarily have a quest, but to engage with learning groups because I think that's where we could have real impact and learn a lot as well as help other groups learn. So that's my plug. Thanks, Judy. That's perfect. And if you can't reach Kevin, flip me an email and I'll reply copying him and you'll be off and running. Um, Michael Julian Mike. Hello. Um, as, I, as I posted in the, the Mattermost chat, I'm um, doing a few things at once today, um, but there's a, a social media summit that MIT is sponsoring that has some good, Good talking heads on their panels. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit, you know, the stuff that's being said is kind of tired stuff that we've heard before, especially if we've seen the social dilemma. But there are some people getting into solutions, and I, I just also um, I wanted to jump on what Judy was saying about um, you know being in other groups and this not being. Um, you know, we, we, we've talked about it and we talked about it in, in some of the offline conversations about the diversity of the group, but I also think it's, it's been great to realize that, you know, as, as I'm sure we all know, we're not the only group of people on Zoom calls having these conversations about how these same problems get solved and being a part of as many of those conversations as you can is great. I like, 
am really wondering how um, how to bring, I don't know who here is interested in being part of um, things that are going on, uh, you know, with the collaboration for uh, ethical, sorry, um, there are so many of these acronyms that I'm forgetting which one. I know. Uh, uh, collaborative Technologists Alliance, uh, <laughs> which um, I know came up in, uh, in a meeting that uh, I was watching that Jerry, you had had with, with Lionsburg, um, but there are people there from other platforms that already exist. And, you know, we're addressing stuff like um, uh, universal standards for profile fields that I know that Vincent and uh, Pete were having a conversation about just between the two of them, that would be great if they, I'm, I'm sorry that neither of them are here today, but, um, you know, it'd be great if they were part of that conversation too. Um, and uh, I don't know, I don't know who here is eager in, in adding to their, their uh, Zoom meeting schedule um, with more, more conversations like this. A lot of them more, you know, specific and technical than this one is. And I don't mean like you have to be a, a CTO to participate in it, um, but just they're like, you know, well, what do we do about this specifically? Um, but uh, if, if anybody wants in on that, I'm really happy to connect. And, so, so thank you for that. And I think part of what you're pointing to is something we need to conquer better as OGM, whatever that is, but, um, how to broadcast interesting events so that anybody who's listening can go, oh, that one sounds like good for me. And we can all meter our Zoom overload, God willing, and uh, you know, work our way there. But then how efficiently to feed back into the mix, into the, 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 the stew we're brewing together, um, what we've learned, what really mattered, what the insights were, and who else to bring, you know, who else to invite into the conversation, whatever that might be, so that so that there's lots of different vortices because. There's, you know, each of us is involved in a bunch of cool activities. How do we become the, 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 the stew pot where we can sort of make some of those connections and, and take it a couple levels higher? And then and, uh, right, right in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna do some more organizing about what goes where in our infrastructure. So that'll be a little clearer. Um, hopefully that will help some, but we also need to do some storming as a group uh, about uh, how we'd like to do that. Uh, but let's just keep that in the back of our heads. Judy, off to you. I would just offer the short comment that what we need is, is a Pete Kaminsky in every room. Of, uh, so I've got some cheek cells of Pete. a combination of a summary <laughs> and, and the digitizing of it into a repository would allow all of us to then get the nuggets without sitting through the seven hours of the day. I, um, yeah. Most of us can't spare the seven hours of a day so we would be scanning this and not knowing with a wise eye, oh, well, I don't wanna miss John's talk and Susan's talk and Joe's talk, but right. I can miss the others and get the summaries later somehow from somebody. And that's the efficient way for us to learn as a group, or at least it's how I learn, because mm -hmm. I, I look at Gaia Fest and it's like, oh, this all looks great, but I don't know who the key speakers are right. unless they're identified as a keynote. And I might miss the gem that's in the sixth talk because I'm not there all day. And in a lot of cases, there is, you know, it is something that is uh, an artifact of the event that can mm -hmm. be shared, which is great. Um, and, you know, in, in situations where I get a chance to do that, it's just not always shareable with people that didn't register for the thing. So sometimes even if you can't go, it makes sense to register so you can get hold of the artifact. Well, and, and even yeah. I would appreciate, you know, if, if there's a, an event I should register so I can get the scripts, right. tell me, you know, I can probably afford the registration fee if it's not $700 or something. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these are free and some are pricey. Um, yeah. But if it's worth it because of some proceedings or some way that I could go back and hear selected talks, that's way better than streaming crap on Netflix. Yeah. You know, so. One thing to do is check the hashtag on Twitter and see if there's a cascade of comments after one panel. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it will say, I can't believe this. This is amazing. Oh, Big that's debate a, between that's actually this a great yeah. suggestion, Mike. Thank you for that. I, that's what I do. I mean, there's, sometimes there's 50 times more comments about one panel. Yeah. Long ago, I wanted to start a service called Don't Miss This, which basically, and, and it would have to have multiple editors because you'd follow the editor you liked. But, but 
basically if there was a sporting event, like I don't really track sports. I'm not a huge fan. I'm a, I'm a Lionel Messi addict. So like love watching him like get past people on YouTube. But, but if there was a, don't miss this service, I would, I, I would then feel less FOMO of course. Uh, but, but that might be an interesting way to curate things. Gil, please. Uh, yeah, Judy, I would, I would subscribe to the service you're describing. I'd pay, so I'd pay for that. And it would be cool to have that as kind of a very low price tier on all participating conferences. You know, people who can't go, can't pay the 700 bucks here for 30 bucks, you get the digest. The, con the, the constraining factor though, isn't people's willingness to pay. I mean, I saw a whole bunch of you nod your heads. Yes. It's how many Pete's do we have? Right. So Jerry's cloning exercise is way behind plan. And, but you know, totally. what does it, what does it take to train up somebody to be a Pete or a Jerry? I've seen, you know, I've had Jerry. Well, there's actually a lot, of, a lot of journalism yeah. schools are starting to do those kinds of things. So there might be interns or other people that would do this, you mm -hmm. know, and they'd, there'd be a learning curve, but I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here, but the, the yeah. infrastructure behind the communication of important content is at the heart of journalism. Yep. And so it might be that we could, I don't know, create a mini guild of journalism interns within OGM and get them started because the feeder stream of these editors, it, I'm envisioning all of these people with these mil millions of skill sets as helpful editors to discern, you know, the real nuggets. Mm -hmm. Something of some kind of tiered structure like that that's very inclusive, you know, where people want to be on this because. You know, they're willing to do X hours free because they want to see what it's about and then maybe they'll get hired and so forth. I don't mean to make this a business. I'm just trying to make it cost effective and self-sufficient. Yeah, there actually do. is a business there. There actually right. is a business there for someone to start. So a couple of things I want to throw back in the conversation. First, I do have a closet here with little Pete clones incubating and I'm teaching them all Linux right now. Um, they're getting stuck on grep. I don't know why it seems like an easy enough thing, but they, they can't seem to get past that. And, and, but they can all install Docker, which is really cool. Um, second, uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that, um, what we do in OGM is a really great conference enhancement process before, during, and after like, like one of the things we can be is a continuous memory across conferences and between the same conference over time. Uh, because one of the problems socially is that we just don't have an ongoing memory. We don't have a place to put things. So as we get closer toward having an open global mind platform-ish thing, that could be a place to put these things. And, and, and Michael, you've got a company called Factor, which could, could become a piece of this. Like, like I'm really interested in that conversation and how, uh, how, to be, how to become collectively that shared memory over time. Then second thing is, I'm just typing in my notes to myself uh, here, into the chat. Second thing is, uh, years ago, I did a couple, not enough of them, but I, did, I called them five minute universities. And it's a format. It's, a, it's an in person format I invented for my retreats. And it was like, um, just put the put a call out whoever wants to speak for only five minutes on something they know a lot about. And one of the one of the nicest ones we ever had was JP Rangaswamy talking for five minutes about how to make the best Bolognese sauce because he traveled around Italy and ate only bolognese sauce until he found the best one. Then he grilled the cook and said, you must tell me your recipe. And then he told us how to make a bolognese. That was a five minute university, but I've got a couple online for some of my favorite books. Um, but if we then, if we summarized our favorite works, the things we know a bunch about and, and like could distill it and put it in very small capsules, I think that helps us process things because my reading stack, my Kindle reader on my iPad has way too many books in it. And I can't seem to get back to Sand Talk to goddamn finish it. Oh, no, 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 wait, I have to read Cast. Oh, damn it. I've got like these other books that are like, you know, totally eating my brain. So if we can help each other dissolve these things and process the nutrients and remix them, I think that's really useful. Um, third, uh, Maven, so I tried to convince Pete years ago. Pete sent an, an apology on our chat earlier saying he's helping David Bauville do the Gaia Fest, which I'll explain last year. But I tried to convince Pete to start a practice called Mavenology, because if you look at uh, Gladwell's book, uh, The Tipping Point, he talks about salesmen, uh, mavens, and connectors, right? And Pete, like in my joke for 20 years now, has been in, you know, in, in the dictionary where it says maven, there should be a little dot portrait of Pete because he's like the Ur maven for me. But if he could train a cadre of mavens to go do this, I think every business meeting, every community meeting ought to have mavens on hand who do the research and feed the collective memory and all of that. So there's the, I think there's a, 
There's a, possibly several businesses to be had around this, which I'm very interested in um, as for benefits, as whatever, uh, that feed data trusts and commons with collective information that over time become the basis for how we make better decisions together. So, so I think where, where we're ending up in this conversation with many of these threads is extremely ogm -y, if you'll forgive the verb uh, or, or adjective, I guess. And then the last thing is that this afternoon, I and a few other people will be participating in a kind of quickly put together event called Gaia Fest uh, that I will ask Pete for the best link to. I think GaiaFest.org now aliases to a baby web page, uh, but we'll be on Zoom showing sort of mind mappy tools around climate change. And Mark Trexler will be there with his climate web and a bunch of others of us will be sort of sharing uh, some ideas around it to kind of set up a conversation that is aiming further down the road, to, road toward COP26, which is happening in Glasgow this year in October, I believe. And the goal, David Bovill has us sort of uh, trying to work together to present some interesting things around climate change uh, then at, at COP26. Uh, and uh, Mike, Mike, go ahead. This is, at Aspen, this is the two sentence rule. Oh, good. There is a uh, books for CEOs. Basically, it takes the 200 page book and turns it into 12 pages. And the second thing, if you haven't gotten familiar with the, uh, I think it was called the Good Judgment Project uh, when it was at, at uh, IARPA. And it's now a, a company led by Terry Murray called, uh, yeah, it's called the Good Judgment Project. And they did a, a really interesting seminar yesterday talking about how they tap into these mavens and predictors. It's, it's all focused on forecasting, but it's more sophisticated than the, the Delphi method. And it's really, uh, really up your alley. I'll, I'll send you some notes about it. So they were funded by IARPA. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah. Just put it in the chat so that we all- Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm put it in the-, in the I just put a link to my brain for it with lots of context because I followed it and it comes out of the Philip Tetlock and the super forecasting stuff and his book, Super Forecasting is super interesting. Yep. Uh, read it years ago. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. It was funded by IARPA. Yeah, I'll put a link to the interview with the CEO. Yeah. Uh, so in my brain under it, it says, um, when, when me, this, this is from an article called The Peculiar Blindness of Experts. And the quote says, when making an argument, foxes often use the word however, while hedgehogs favor moreover. Okay, then. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go back to uh, Julian, Mike, Craig. Uh, sorry, Ken. Before that, Ken. Just, just a real quick thing um, to let you know that um, I have taken your idea of Five and University into Kiko Lab, and we now have on Kiko Lab every week uh, the hot seat where someone comes in, talks for five minutes about something, and there's 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. So Five and University lives on in Kiko Lab. As a hot seat. Thank you. I love that. I love that. Okay, now Julian, Mike Craig. All right, well, my check-in is not as substantial as the others because I've been dealing with lots and lots of distractions trying to get a handle on managing those so I can get some work done. I at least have an incentive in that SIGGRAPH is in three months and I need to have some major demonstrations ready by then. So I'm looking forward to next week when I can start working on that. Uh, also feeling much safer now that I'm out of the safety zone after the second shot. Um, as a total distraction from what we've been talking about, I've mentioned before, I used to be the chief scientist at Lego. Uh, Lego has a podcast series talking about the history of their different digital efforts over the years. I'll put a link in the chat to the episode that came out last month about the group that I was in. And then uh, finally, this is a you heard it here first thing. Uh, last week, one of the vendors I deal with frequently convinced me to have a workshop. Um, many years ago, I organized the NASA Virtual Ironbird Workshop, which deal, dealt with what we called knowledge integrating virtual vehicles. Uh, but as you know, this was, this was uh, based on the space shuttle, and you know that was EOL a long time ago. So this time it's going to be a more general workshop, uh, the technology of interdisciplinary knowledge management, unless I can come up with a snazzier title. Uh, but this will be very much focused on getting, going all over the place and tying them all together. Uh, and also, it's going to be organized in the safe time because I think the personal communication is absolutely essential. Uh, any kind of Zoom or online is only really only going to be just for monitoring. We really, really need the hallway conversations and 
you know, you, you just can't do that on Zoom or any of the other platforms. So I'm presuming this is going to come out next year just to make sure that things are absolutely safe. Could you just put a little bit about that in the chat and matter most so that it's there and maybe your contact information? Right now, the, the only little bit I have is that title. So. Okay. But I'll, I'll be working on refining that because, of course, that need, that's the kind of thing that needs like, like a year advance notice for people. And Julian, have you crossed paths with the guy who did the mini chef restaurant? No. The, 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 the Lego thing? <clears throat> so there's a restaurant, I think, at Legoland. Uh, there's a restaurant called Mini Chef. I can post a, a link to it. But you order, you, you sit down at a table and to order, you open a little kit of Legos and you make your order with the little kit of Legos. And then you submit that and then your food shows up on a conveyor and you can then watch as your, as your food order is assembled behind the curtain, basically. And then your order shows up on a conveyor that rolls down in a big Lego, which you open up and it would contain whatever your meal was. Uh, it's 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 hokey, but it's it's cute. And the guy who designed this whole thing, uh, I met just a few months ago. So <clears throat> that's uh, that was one of the things we were trying to do with L3D back in the '90s was that people could design their own models and send off the the bill of materials to Lego, and a few weeks later get back a kit with those bricks in it. They sort of carried that out with Lego Digital Designer, and then abandoned the idea, I guess, because the fulfillment cost was too high. Anyway. With thousands of Lego bricks available, it just took too much time for somebody to go and pick through and get the, the right count, especially because you get tired and you pick up a little piece and boom, it falls on the floor and then it's under a counter. And so. yeah, yeah, it'd be fun to do now with uh, 3D printers, I don't, but I don't know if 3D printers are, if the materials are durable enough or precise enough to mm -hmm. make Lego parts. They're not. Damn. Well, well, wait a minute. <laughs> they will make Lego compatible parts, but not replacements. Oh, okay. Well, that's that. That's better than I thought. Uh, let's go, Mike, Craig, Stacy. Well, you heard the most emotional part of my week, which is this growing angst about COVID. Um, I, I really think this has been driving a lot of my neuroses for at least a year. And back in summer of last year, I was looking at what was going to happen to India and thinking about what chaos could happen. But set that aside. Um, Two of the most exciting things I'm working on right now are the Internet Governance Forum USA. And if anybody has any ideas on people who can really help us understand why we haven't gotten good digital identity yet, I'm all ears. And if you don't have a name, give me an article or a blog. The second question is we're looking at the evolution of online markets and online communities. And so I'm gonna call up April and see if I can get some of her time. And then the last one is the one that's the most difficult. And um, it, it's the, the title is, it's 2025. Can my apps work everywhere? Four scenarios, three of them bad. So the question is, how could the nations of the world do things that would make it impossible for a five person startup to serve 10 million people around the world um, what might happen that would make it impossible for me to take my little devices and have them work in all of the countries I visit on my next mm -hmm. round the world trip? Mm -hmm. um, really important issue. And, and this, is, this is the most influential internet governance meeting in the US each year. So we're, we're looking for some really good people to help us frame these issues. Um, that's the main thing. Um, the other big news is yesterday was our one month anniversary of our wedding. So Yay. <laughs> so we celebrated by getting our second COVID shot. Yay. And no side effects. Yay. Oh, that, that's great. Yeah, April got her first shot yesterday. I get mine yes. today. Did you do Pfizer or Moderna? I did Pfizer and I did it in the morning. So it's been 24 hours. So I'm, I had I no idea. I've got a lot of friends who have had a lot of hellish side effects. So it's not, I'm, I consider myself lucky. Like my, that's such a 2021 time. way to sell, have an anniversary. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of my theories is that the people who have well-challenged immune systems that aren't germaphobes already have a lot of inherent intrinsic immunities and they have less reaction than yep. people who have been really germaphobic and haven't challenged their immune system. So their immune system is just gearing up. The Spanish flu took out 
the the flower of youth because the stronger your immune system the faster it got turned against you and mm -hmm. you could you could die within 48 hours or less with the spanish flu like uh donald trump's grandfather was walking with him down the street one day and two days later was dead of the spanish flu um it was just devastating but it took out very healthy the, the better your immune system the faster you would succumb to the spanish flu go ahead gil um, yeah, my wife uh, had a stem cell transplant six months ago. She's a few days away from getting her second shot, Pfizer. And we just discovered last week that nobody really knows how effective this vaccine is for people who've had stem cell transplants. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, we're asking around and it, it just didn't come up in the discussions with our doctors. We found some literature saying, you know, might not be effective. I haven't seen anything that says it might be more dangerous, but uh, there's a lot we don't know about this stuff. Maybe she could become part of a clinical study or something like that. Uh, there may not be enough of them to know, but uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting, thank you. Um, let's go, uh, Craig, Stacy, Ken. Yo, hey folks. Greetings. Yeah, uh, this reminds me of a, a, a doctored photograph I saw on Facebook, I think a year or so ago when we all started wearing masks. It was the Rolling Stones, all four of them wearing masks but not Keith Richards. He was just looking into the camera like, huh? me? <laughs> me? <laughs> no. <laughs> I won't get a COVID shot uh, until the end of the year. Because I'm here in Thailand, I'm a resident foreigner. Um, they'll vaccinate dogs before they <laughs> vaccinate wow. human, uh, human <laughs> foreigners here in Thailand. And I'll certainly have to pay for it too, probably a couple of hundred bucks. Wow. Just to throw that into the mix. Uh, yeah. That's actually, we're having a, a, quite a surge right here now in Thailand. I've got a page up here somewhere with the data. Thailand did a very serious lockdown in the, in the beginning for eight weeks. We were all at home. There were policemen and uh, army officers on every street corner, just about in all the small towns, you couldn't move without a mask and you had to have a good reason to be outside. That was all nine, 10 months ago that ended. And Thailand had uh, like Vietnam, less than 20 deaths until a month ago. Oh, wow. Um, only a few hundred cases i can't remember what the number was but it was very low in a country of 76 million it's it's uh we all have all believed those of us who live here for months that uh we're escaping it the country and the people the government everybody has done really well and it's just really not happening here and then just about two months ago a uh, couple of bus, bus loads of uh, people from Burma came over to a place near Bangkok to work in factories. And now, today, we have 46,643 cases. 20,000 of them are in hospital. 112 deaths. Wow. And 90% <clears throat> of that has occurred in the last month. And the situation in Myanmar is horrible just horrible Absolutely. on the ground in Myanmar. So to expect that nobody else is going to try to cross borders is like crazy too. So. Absolutely awful. You know, I mean, sometimes uh, parts of America, parts of Europe are not terribly civilized, not as civilized as we, uh, as yeah. we all <clears throat> would like them to be. But over here, um, this is the only place I've lived in Southeast Asia or South Asia for that, for that matter. But I have become very uh, aware that over here, a human life is uh, a come and go thing. It's, uh, humans are expendable. Two kids come flying off a motorcycle and end up under a bus or something. People kind of shrug. Not their families, obviously, but people around, mm -hmm. pe the people around in cafes or, or sitting at restaurants, they'll watch it happen and nobody will stop eating or drinking. They might nudge each other and we'll have a look at that, you know. So living, uh, living outside of the West is, uh, is really rather different mm -hmm. than living in the West. Mm -hmm. Do you have mm -hmm. a cultural insight into why that attitude is prevalent? 
Do I know why? Um, short answer, no, not, <laughs> not, not exactly. But the, one of their favorite sayings is uh, something like along the lines of, oh, Buddha, take care. Um, I mean, you've got bus drivers get on the bus in the morning at the bus station, 60 people in the back, and the bus driver, he comes on, and he gives everybody on the bus a nice gesture, and then he takes his flowers that he's bought from the monks at the bus station, and he hangs them up over the mirror, and he gets on his seat, and he prays before he starts the bus and drives away, because Buddha's going to take care. Whatever happens out there on the road, Buddha's in charge. So we don't have to worry. <laughs> I, I'm from Scotland. I never, I didn't grow up thinking like this. So I still find it all, all a bit I think weird, in Scotland, you, know? you have like a wee dram before driving the bus, right? Yeah, we've got our solutions as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole other ethic, a whole other religion. Uh, yeah. I have so, uh, ethic, so I know a bit about that. <laughs> let that be my check in. I've got nothing else. Yeah, Craig, thank you so much for the sense of what it's like where you are. Really, um, I just felt oh. transported. <laughs> no worries. Um, Stacy, Ken, John. Yeah, so this has been a really interesting call for me to listen to. Um, I spend probably too much time trying to get into the mindset of that 10%. I'm hoping it's only 10% Trump cult following. And particularly when it comes to the vaccines, you know, and I'm listening to everything that they have to say, um, resisting wearing masks. What comes to mind is that there's a great opportunity there for, um, for teaching about, you know, farming and uh, what's happening to the soil and to switch, like what you said before about how, um, how Gordon understands how conservatives couldn't see the financial possibilities. And the reason I'm saying this is because so many of them are convinced that if we only had healthy immune systems, that there would not be a reason to fear the virus. And to a certain degree, I mean, it is important that we have healthier immune systems. And I just think that from a marketing point of view, that would be a great way, you know, Again, we're not going to convince anybody to take a vaccine if they don't want to. But if we could just push that topic aside and still engage with them and teach about what's happening to the soil and try to just shift our focus, I think that's an opportunity that gets lost because we talk to people that believe like we do, I'm saying in gen the general way. And if they were like us, they'd be convinced already. So we have to find other ways, we have to learn to listen to what they're listening to. And so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> um, thanks, Stacey. There's a thing I learned about only recently called the terrain theory of disease that was promoted by Antoine Béchamp, a Frenchman way back when. And this sort of turned into the Pasteur versus Béchamp germ theory versus terrain debate. And this is kind of a little bit of historical precursor toward the, if you just keep yourself healthy and have the right nutrients, you're gonna be fine. Which by the way, sort of runs a bit in the face of the, the thing I said a moment ago about the Spanish flu took out the people with the healthiest immune systems because it turned them against them, right? So let's pretend that you were like, that your terrain was like really healthy. You might in fact be the first, the first picked uh, by by the disease, so so I think the, so I think the whole conversation is super interesting, and I, it feels to me like in the last week I've seen five good articles about this and and about you know um, different kinds of approaches to how to convince people and and how to have these conversations. Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, uh, and the, then back to Stacy. Yeah, the terrain versus um, pathogen theory in in medical parallels the conversation in agriculture. Yeah. Uh, Pesticides, do you build soil? Do you build health of ecosystem to respond effectively? Uh, a notable that Pasteur on his deathbed uh, said, Bessel, the, so this other guy was, pro was probably right. Was probably right? Oh, that's interesting. That's fascinating. Um, Stacy, then John. Yeah, I was oh. just. I was oh, just sorry, then Julian, uh, you, you moved on me. Oh, yeah. I, no, I, I was pretty much done, but I just wanted to say that what I'm talking about is 
sometimes we may have to accept that we can't change a person's mind on something, but we could use the parts of their argument that we agree with to, you know, shift our focus to something else that's important. Absolutely. I love that. Uh, Julian, go ahead. I was going to mention a different terrain theory, uh, which is that people of my generation who grew up in rural areas like I did would sometimes end up eating dirt. And when I got to college, I found that it was in general healthier than my roommates. That was my husband's adage. He grew up on a farm. He said, we don't need to be super. He was a physician too. He said, we do not need to be super, super careful about this. I ate dirt as a kid and I'm fine. You know. So I, I grew up in Lima, Peru for my first 10 years. And my, my, we got there and my mom met the, the ladies of the American community and the expat community who were all boiling the water and keeping their kids away from all the germs. And my mom's like, seriously? <laughs> so I could drink from the hose. Like, you know, she said the first couple of times, like, bad colic, bad whatever, but then I could wander around and just like not worry about street food and, and drinking from a hose. And I remember like feeling like really free that way. But I, and I don't remember the other side. I don't remember my buddies having to worry that much. That it wasn't an issue for me. But uh, I'm grateful for that. So I figure those germs are those uh, those antibodies are long out of my system. But it, but for a while I was probably a little bit stronger than your average American uh, in that way. Let's go, Ken John Klaus. Um, when I was a young man, I traveled for 10 months in Southeast Asia and my first week in the Philippines, I met a man from Gibraltar who actually looked a little bit like Craig. Um, and he said to me, let me give you a tip. I've been traveling in Southeast Asia for 20 years, eat the local food, where the locals eat it, the way the locals eat it. If you see, uh, tourists in a restaurant, stay away. If you see locals, cause the, the vendors can poison the tourists, but they can't poison the locals. And the other thing is everything was filled with hot peppers. And I came to believe that there's very few things that want to live in your intestinal tract when it is filled with hot peppers. Um, and the ultimate test was when I was on the border of India and Nepal, and it was 115 degrees. And there was no chai vendor. And the only thing there was the most disgusting drinking fountain you've ever seen. And I learned that when you are thirsty, you will drink out of anything. <laughs> and I went over and drank from this thing. No ill effects. So uh, like you, Jerry, I think those antibodies are long gone. But um, there, is, there are ways to build up your immune system. Um, mm -hmm. However, novel things can wipe it out. The people of Turtle Island, First Nations people before the Europeans, probably had incredible immune systems. Everything was local, everything was organic, everything was in season. These folks were in superb physical condition. And then all of a sudden they see something, their immune system from the Europeans they'd never had to cope with before and they're dead in a few days. So both things need to be weighed, I think. It's a very interesting thing. Yeah. Um, Jerry sent out an email the other day uh, to talk about this call and I, no one's mentioned it yet, but I am just so much more relaxed now after the Chauvin verdict than I was. I was like, if this goes badly, there's going to be, uh, Oakland's going to go up in flames, you know, Berkeley. Just, uh, so I'm really grateful um, for the verdict. And related to that, um, I recently finished CAST and I've, I've been hanging out on the Kiko Lab calls and I observed an interaction that no one called out. So I called it out. So what happened was there was a question posed of what is a, a big dynamic going on in the world today? And a black person said, slavery versus humanity. And immediately a white person jumped in and said, well, I hear that, but let's rephrase that to power over versus power with. And no one said anything. And I was distracted because I had a repair person in my house. So I, I wrote to Charles and, and Lauren and they said, let's bring it up to the next meeting. And that has led to a very, very powerful conversation on race in this group. Um, I asked the, the person who said slavery versus humanity, what it was like for him when that person corrected me, he said, I chose, you got to choose your moments. I realized I noted it. And I thought, if I want to go down this and take a lot of verbiage, I'll talk for half an hour about all the problems with that, you know? And so I just chose to let it go. But we got into a really intense conversation um, of how often, and this comes from caste, um, people who feel that they're in the superior position can correct people they think are in the inferior caste, which happens to be race in this instance, right? Um, so we've just been really unpacking a lot of stuff over there. And it's really fascinating to see, uh, there's a very lovely woman who's incredibly articulate talking about how she was really upset with 
several of the white men because they're like, oh, boo hoo, can't this go away? Aren't we past this? We are all one. We should all be human beings. And she's like, you guys, we've been doing this for centuries and you're acting like you just want this over now. You have no stamina. You have no patience. And as she's saying this, the guy she was directly addressing is being defensive in the chat window with her. And I'm like, will you just shut the fuck up and listen? You know, I mean, you cannot learn if you're being defensive. This woman is giving you really good information here and you are being defensive for your ego's sake instead of going, wow, I hadn't realized that, you know? So it goes to Stacy's point about how do we get into the mindsets of folks who are really entrenched in a position and open it up in a way. And related to that, Klaus and I are both in this, this group with the evolutionary leadership community where we're, um, yesterday we were on a call studying Daniel Christian Wall's uh, work on, on regenerative culture. And there's a woman on there who worked in the oil and gas industry. And she said, I, I, I change agent there. And I get really interested in how do we introduce and socialize ideas that that can be an extinction level threat for people in a way where they don't see it as an extinction level threat. So in oil and gas, a regenerative economy, a, a renewable economy, renewable energy, that's an extinction level threat for their business model. And how do you in, engage them in inviting them into the conversation in a way where they can show up as leaders and contributors and they've got something really useful there. So you have to to destigmatize it and and take the antagonism out, um, and I'm like, I really want to talk to you a lot more, and I couldn't because it's a very short Zoom breakout room. But I love this idea of let's examine some of the things that we in OGM take as, you know, this is just totally logical. We need a regenerative economy. Well, for Archer Daniel, Daniels Midland, that's a very big threat. So how do we talk to those people? How do we invite them in in ways where that idea gets socialized into something that they say. Hmm, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Let me, you know, let me, let me, uh, let's, let's, let's work together on that. So that's some of the stuff that's floating around in my life right now. A tiny link into that again, Ken, first, um, thank you for everything you just brought into the conversation. It was like magical. Um, a tiny hook onto the last part of what you were talking about. Uh, many years ago, I sat down next to a, at, at a dinner at an event, I sat down next to a woman from Cargill. And I'm like, ah, this is going to be hard. Because the moment she says, oh, I'm with Cargill. How are you doing? Whatever. I'm like, you know, ADM and Cargill are kind of like the green merchants of the world. Ah. And then it turns out that Cargill is a world-class hero about bribery. They have a global policy to not make or take under the table payments. And they could teach a master's class on how to get, you know, how to stop corruption uh, around, you know, their, their business and their trade. And I'm like, Holy crap. So, so if, if you don't see anybody, everybody as the enemy and you figure out what they're good at, maybe there's a way to harness some of that, those energies. At least there's a really nice way to enter and become friends uh, and learn a lot from them because, you know, the person who's an idiot in math turns out to be brilliant at baseball stats. Like it's weird, but we all have our quirks and our, and our, our depths uh, and looking for people's depths and, and appreciating them for those is like a really important way to to build connection and trust and, and make a step toward anything. Um, so check out my posts on Celeste Headley that I've been putting up on the OGM forum. She is the, 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 the maven on this. She really knows how to have conversations with people uh, and 10 tips that will really change your ability to interact. Thank you, Kim. Uh, if do you want to repost a little bit in the chat here? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it up on Mattermost again. So, yeah. Thank you. And I've been curating those into my brain under Celeste Headley. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let a post like that. Um, so, uh, oops, I had a list here. Uh, John, Klaus, Doug, George Gill. Go ahead, John. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Ken, just a brief uh, hook to your, what do you do if you're sitting next to Cargill? You know, I had to do a workshops for oil companies as well. This is not a magic trick. I mean, this doesn't, uh, necessarily move people, although I did get a division of an oil company to stop its engagement in plastic uh, food, partly by scaring them about cancer. But, you know, the main trick we used is you write future uh, news stories that are not nightmares. They're, they're plausible. You have to get somebody who will attest 
yes, this could actually happen. And that, that wouldn't be good. Okay. And then you just ask people, will this happen or not? Not, is it good or bad? Not, do you want it? Of course you don't want it, you know, but I mean, will this happen or not? Let's collect the votes and you have them on a continuum. And as the votes come in, they begin to say, geez, we, we are both, we're the voters and our votes are beginning to look like something we don't want to see. And, you know, there's a real art to this, but you can, you can try to crack open the door of, well, gee, if we really don't want that, what are the, you know, what's the scenario in which it's, it doesn't have the far reaching negative consequences that we think it will have. And uh, it, like I say, it doesn't always work, but it has worked in a few cases when in particular one oil company got them out of the plastic business. Um, as far as what I've been doing, I've been, uh, I like your uh, analogy, Jerry, about growing little peats in, in the closet. Uh, <laughs> I think both, both you and uh, Pete are unclonable, but I have been kind of doing ghost Pete or ghost Jerry in the sense of I've been helping other people by editing, writing or editing uh, in background um, around uh, digital identity travel documents and uh, some other kinds of uh, details. And I also, I, I couldn't, you know, we're all overbooked. There's, this is the last day of something called the Internet Identity Workshop. I had trouble getting in, but I got into what's one session yesterday and it was fantastic. The title of the session was um, DAO, which, you know, Digital Autonomous Organization, DAO and Governance. And uh, all the, the woman running it uh, is an expert. And uh, she, Grace, uh, I'll I'll put I'll put something in the chat about it. Thank you. Um, she said, and we agree. Agreed. You know, we started out interested in democracy, but you realize trying to talk about democracy and not understanding money, and not and, and you got to understand money way beyond the 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 conventional concepts of money and the conventional concepts of of uh, credit interest rate, all those kind of things. There's a whole bizarre fantasy world of libertarian uh, digital currency, you know, where people say, well, you know, we'll do this and, you know, and we don't have government and we don't have, and we don't pay taxes and we'll all get rich. And, you know, and it was totally nuts, but you need, you need to be really precise and really careful in order to indicate where the gap is <laughs> in that kind of thinking. And then to start thinking creatively which is what I'm interested in as a project is how do we have a pro-social, pro-environment coexistence of fiat and digital currencies side by side, where at least one of the digital currencies is like uh, eco green stamps. It's a, you pay people, you pay people to do good things with fiat and digital. They can use their digital. They could convert it back into fiat if they absolutely have to, but the, the rate is really poor. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to use the digital to buy a lot more of the good thing that you were, that you were having a transaction in, um, including services from other, other creative professionals. That's, that's a very incomplete vision, but that's a vision I'm working on for uh, coexistence of fiat and uh, positive digital going into the future. Thank you. And, and, there's the whole complication that most crypto, well, blockchain dependent cryptocurrencies are melting the earth in some sense and yeah, using that, up resources like crazy. So I may, have, I may be too soon on this, but I'm going to say that the, the, the trust communities and the proof of stake strategy uh, alleviates most of the blockchain problem. Right, right. Um, so in the early days of the internet, there was a problem because traffic was growing too fast. And this guy named Van Jacobson invented a protocol that compressed the headers on message over the internet. And that solved like a really giant traffic issue until people started building, releasing bigger pipes to connect to the early intertubes. So I see, I see uh, the optimist in me sees the global meltdown because of the uh, proof of work protocols as a, an obstacle to solve that might, might be solvable. But to me, the proof of work is such a gigantor waster on purpose that I have a hard time figuring out that we're going to sort of make it all work. But I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, Gil, go ahead. 
Yeah, and someday let's talk about NFT. Um, to John's point about the, um, the hybrid currencies and reward systems, there are a stack of apps that are trying to do that um, out of the United States, out of Europe, a number of other places that are in various ways, letting you track your behavior, score eco points, uh, convert those to some kind of currency, fiat or digital, and, you know, and, and buy more junk with that that will, of course, generate more environmental problems. So interesting game underway there. I'm, I'm advising one of them. John, I'd love to talk with you more about it. Thanks, Gil. Right, go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I don't know if this is important or not, but since I know, I just want to point out that half the people, when they see DAO, that for that D stands for decentralized. So I don't know if that makes a difference, but I figured I would just say that. Thank you. Um, let's go Klaus, Doug, George, Gill, and with apologies, uh, we're gonna have to wrap the call at uh, a minute before the top of the, I mean, before the half hour, so we may not make it through the list. Yeah, it has been, it has been, uh, uh, a busy week, a um, couple of weeks, really. But uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm extremely hopeful uh, and encouraged to see how uh, agriculture and soil health has taken center stage in the conversation. And I think it will be uh, a big focus this week uh, in the uh, discussions that uh, Biden has with the uh, uh, world leaders on on uh, on climate change. So, for example, here, here is uh, an initiative that uh, uh, we're participating in. I'm representing business climate leaders in this European thing here. Um, uh, that's the 4 per thousand international initiative is, sort of, is a, a key part of um, convincing the world that uh, by adding four per mil of carbon into the soil on an annualized basis, we can basically arrest uh, carbon emissions output. Um, and that has really that that started at the Paris Climate Accord, and has since um, really taken root. Uh, and and uh, in the here in the U.S., there are several organizations like Regeneration International, um, and and uh, a host of NGOs who have subscribed to this and, and are using this uh, as uh, as sort of a guiding uh, uh, thought process. You know where where to take this. Um, then we have, uh, um, we just started uh, to launch, we just launched uh, another webinar that uh, I've been working on for business climate leaders as well. And the, the, the point of this is that uh, it's called soil carbon sequestration, a systems perspective. And we have in the conversation, a farmer uh, the uh, uh, chief soil, the chief science uh, officer for the American Soil Health Institute, or you can see it in the in the clip here, who who, who is on the panel. But um, the, the 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 way we have scripted the conversation, and we are still, of course, uh, advancing this, is that we want to give a systems perspective. That means if the farmer wants to convert into regenerative practices, he needs to have a market to sell his products into which is currently not the case. Currently only 3% of American farmers are using cover crops. 3%, I mean, it's just, it's just completely astonishing. Uh, but for that to advance, um, if a cover crop doesn't become a cash crop, then it's just another cost factor. You know? And so the farmers are, are not going for it. So there are a couple of things happening. One is that uh, carbon markets are being established that pay the farmer on a per ton basis for the sequestration of carbon. It's a hugely contentious issue, but the science is advancing very rapidly to, uh, to find um, uh, measurements that are uh, cost-effective, fast, you know, and, and reliable. Um, but it's a complicated issue because if a farmer changes their processes, then the carbon is being released again. So uh, that's one topic. But then more importantly, and this is where, where and I contacted the Harvard University, you know, they have this Menus of Change initiative and working with the Culinary Institute of America there to, to, to help the catering industry to think through the changes they have to anticipate in their menu planning and in their sourcing strategy. And that's the point of this, of this uh, webinar here that we're giving is you need to, you need to queue up changes uh, coming your way to, uh, uh, to, uh, 
link up with the with the needs of the farmer to change their practices. So that's that's a uh, uh, and then you know, we have uh, uh, you know, Jerry uh, you know, Pete everyone engaged in uh, in a discussion with the global regenerate the regeneration collab. Um, which is like super promising. I mean, these guys are on fire. They actually responded to us with such speed and, and enthusiasm that we are kind of uh, trying to catch our breath, catching up with them. But I think that may have really some, some uh, good prospects there. So it's good. I mean, we lots of stuff happening. Uh, it's hard to keep up. That it is. That, that it most definitely is. There's a lot going on. Thank you, Klaus. Um, Doug, George, and Gil. Okay. Uh, I keep searching for the simplest way to take a group of executives that uh, are good at having tactical conversations, but not strategic conversations, and how to lift them up into the strategic sphere. So I did a workshop yesterday with a group of senior uh, government uh, managers. And I used the following method. We started out, and uh, they're told ahead that this is what's going to happen, uh, talking first about where are we in the historical moment, then shifting the discussion to, okay, how did we get here? And then shifting the discussion to, okay, what can happen? And then shifting the discussion to what then should we do? And it went really, really well. It's a, it's a kind of non-method method. It doesn't put method in your face. It doesn't feel controlled or, or constrained or manipulated. Uh, and the, the, the last part of the day uh, was really, really much more strategic than anything that they had ever done before. We then did a transcript of the meeting quickly with uh, turning everything into bullet points, getting it back to the group within an hour. Uh, and then with the idea that they can add to it anything they want and we'll edit it into a document. So it was a great method. Uh, I really liked it. It's an evolution out of doing scenarios uh, where uh, I always felt like scenarios were weird because it's like starting from the present going towards the future. But hey, wait a minute, very few strategic managers think that way. They're also looking at the past. It's more, instead of like the runner at the block, it's like sitting on a surfboard, uh, watching a wave come, riding it up, letting it go, uh, watching another one until you get the dynamics of the system and then you can make a better choice. So how to turn scenarios around to doing that. So I added in this part of, uh, you know, where are we? How did we get here? And uh, typically groups like this are never historically minded. But when you do the, how, do we, how did we get here? It turns out they've got a lot of resources in understanding history that they never draw on. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was my day yesterday. It sounds super interesting. And I love the surfer metaphor of looking for the breaks because you do, you have to, you have to become aware of and then figure out what the pattern is <clears throat> in the, of the forces in the environment. And we don't do enough of that uh, nearly. Um, thank you, Doug. Uh, let's go George and then Gil and see if we can squeak in under the wire here. And I noticed that Mark Carranza is in the room, by the way. <clears throat> I just see, I see his name there. And uh, Mark has been feeding uh, not a visual mind map, but rather a, a database of notes and, uh, that connects everybody <clears throat> for longer than I've been doing the brain. So I'll post a, a link to Mark in my brain in the chat, but let's go quickly to uh, George and then Gil. I think Gil was trying to get in. Uh, I'd rather hear Gil than me. Uh, uh, Gil, sorry, were you? I, I, I didn't know if your hand was up from before or from new. Sorry. Uh, you're muted now. My hand was up from before. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought he would try. I thought he was trying to urgently get in. As you can see, I'm experimenting with uh, audio only on Zoom. I, um, I, I, that was my assumption from your curious George there. So, yes. Um, I had a very interesting thing happen to me with regard to Zoom. I was on a 210 person Zoom call and um, the guy who was running it wanted an interactive discussion about the goals of his course and what, 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 he, what we all wanted and all that. 
uh, it was on, it was a course on Rome, advanced uses of Rome. And uh, he like at it, he knows that I'm a very experienced audio moderator. So he just said, hey, George, will you run that half an hour of the discussion? And I said, sure, you know, I wasn't expecting it, but here's the way I do it. So I asked them to all put their microphones on, N unmute your microphones. Only 100 people complied. There are people who just can't do it or won't do it. Uh, but 100 people open mic. And I said, I'm not going to call on anybody. And um, let's see what happens as an experiment. Um, I've been up to 300 on audio only, so I knew it was going to happen. But they were all skeptical and conducted a completely normal conversation as if we were all in somebody's living room. Of course, you couldn't fit 100 people in your living room. Mm -hmm. uh, but it worked out fine. And People are buzzing about it all over Twitter now, uh, about this incredible conversation. Uh, so people are discovering audio, and it's uh, taking a leadership. I'm taking a leadership role in uh, training moderators on Clubhouse and and uh, Twitter Spaces. Um, but it's more in having directed, goal goal oriented discussions. Most of the discussions on these. On, uh, on what's being now called social audio are um, chat, just hanging out, chilling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. That serves a social function. It's not what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm interested in more purposeful problem solving, decision making, creative kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going to see if we can bring that to the different different media. Awesome, thanks, George. And uh, when I, oh, ran, and I was very, I was very happy to hear that you want to give more of a purpose to these conversations because I'm beginning to wonder, what are we doing? Why am I here? What's going on here? What is o OGM? When Jerry says OGM, -E, I don't know what the hell that means. Um, I'm glad to see you waving your hands and not. Uh, but you can only see me waving my hands because I'm not off video, but still. Yeah, but I know, I know. Yeah, uh, um, and and by the way, the, uh, totally legitimate questions, but did you, uh, in, a, in a previous call, might've just been last last Thursday, I said like there's the dip and dip and mix kind of metaphor that I use, which is I think of the Thursday calls and just the Thursday calls as I'm dipping my ladle into the stream of what's happening in, among us. And then, mm -hmm. I, and, then, and then when it smells like something that's about our purpose, I then mix it into the stew. Did you catch that part? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that that did not give you any sense of purpose. Well, I'd like to see more of that. I mean. Okay. We can yeah. do. We can lather, rinse, repeat on that. Although lather, rinse, repeat plus stew does not sound appetizing, but still. No. Right. Um, stew quickly, doesn't sound appetizing. Uh, stew not so good anymore. I don't know what happened to stew. Yeah. So so Gil and then Mark, if we have the time. Yeah. Lather, rinse, repeat, and uh, clone Pete. Yeah. Um, so that's repeat. Yeah, there you go. So I mean, there's, you know, there, there's a thread through this whole call, there's something to be done about building the capacity of people to, to curate complex conversations and across conversations with common themes. And I just I, I'm, 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 I think that's a really important piece here. Um, a couple of things in, in general, I'm very grateful, um, not just at the Chauvin verdict, uh, somebody observed on Tuesday, that the second biggest crime there was that we were all so worried about what the outcome would be. Mm -hmm. Very telling about us. Um, but, um, you know, the, the activity on climate, uh, Biden is holding a global climate summit today where the United States is going to plant 50% uh, greenhouse gas reductions by 2030, a big leap from where things were before. Um, um, you know, this is, ties back to me for uh, what Ken and Jerry both talked about, about talking to corporations. This has been a good, good part of my work for the past 30 years. Um, and the basic MO has been to go inside and say, you know, given that you care about making more money and reducing risk, here's ways you can do that that will reduce climate impact, et cetera, and make you more money. Um, uh, not unique to me. A lot of us have been playing in that field. And it's really gratifying to see how that, what was a fringe conversation 20, 30 years ago is now part of the mainstream conversation. It's every company is talking about this. Every policymaker is talking about this. Uh, the Wall Street firms are talking about this. One third of assets under management in the U.S. have some sort of ESG, environmental, social, and governance filter on them. Adequate, no, but the what, what's normal in normal, polite conversation among powerful institutions has really changed. 
uh, and that's gratifying. Um, um, Doug, to your point about uh, turning scenarios around, I think the opportunity there is not just to incorporate the past and find the pattern, but to start from the future or bring the future into the present in a, in a more purposive or directed way, which is to say, where do you want to be? What would you like it to look like? What would be a good world? Um, this is a core element of the natural step framework, which we've used a lot with companies, which grounds them in the fundamental non-controversial, non-debatable science of physics and evolutionary biology, distills some principles of what working systems are, and then works backwards from there, not forward from the present moment of reasonable small steps, but backward from an ideal of how might you get there, reverse engineering the mission like NASA did with the Apollo mission. So all pretty cool stuff. Um, I find myself in this in a, in a very perplexed situation, both with regard to the corporate work and with regard to the Trump voters that I think, Stacy, you were talking about. Because uh, <clears throat> like I said, most of my work has been inside trying to uh, infect companies with some new thinking that addresses their, their, their sense of their concerns in a new direction. Uh, and another part of me, well, in my history and now is thinking this entire structure is deeply fucked. There are structural flaws, four or five structural flaws in capitalism that severely impede the possibility of impact capitalism, social capitalism, reform capitalism, democratic capitalism, conscious capitalism, all the things that people are talking about. And so I'm cooking a piece of, of writing on that. Uh, and I'm feeling kind of schizophrenic of being inside and outside. Uh, same, a similar kind of, of dilemma with regard to the Trump voters. Um, you know, on the one hand, there are, I think, in really important opportunities to engage and to try to restitch the, the social fabric of this country, because uh, this can't go on. Um, and um, one of the ways I think to get to that is not just to talk with them, but to listen to them, um, both to understand their concerns, but it's tricky because if I go to go out to listen to a Trump voter to understand her concerns, to be able to more effectively change her point of view, I'm not really listening. And so really listening requires me to be open to being changed by her, as well as her being changed by me. And am I willing to do that? I don't know. Um, so there's that whole mess. And the, and the dilemma there is, do we engage and try to restitch the social fabric or we try to beat the crap out of them and defeat them in every turn and obliterate the fascist tendency? in this country. So another dilemma there. Um, I've been, um, this week res resumed uh, a large webinar series talking about climate COVID pandemic era, the process of change and some of these things. Uh, Jerry, I you know you were there yesterday, I was glad to see you. Um, um, so George, I'm intrigued uh, by your comment about goal-directed conversation, because this is sort of that. It's, um, you know, I think of it as a community of, of inquiry. Um, and practice, and mm -hmm. and I'm sort of finding my way in how to curate these. <clears throat> we structured it with with an opening presentation by me, some discussion in the open group, uh, some breakouts, more discussion back in the groups, and it's really not clear what works. I've uh, just started calling it collaborative thinking, which is exactly the opposite of groupthink. Yep. And so in groupthink, the individual subordinates to the group and the group kind of has a mind of its own and it's a disaster. It's the mind, it's basically mob mentality. Yeah. Uh, and, but collaborative thinking, you're using the resources of the group, each individual in the group, mm -hmm. intensely maintaining their individuality, yep. <clears throat> uses the resources, the experience, the ideas, the, the creativity, all the whole list of things from the group to each individual and it's electric. And most people have never had a conversation like that maybe since the dorm room in college. Yep, yep. And the challenge is how do you do that in a large group? Um, I think I, I, I'm working on those technologies. I've been I'd love to, working I'd love on to, those for 40 years. I'd love to talk with you more about that because you know, we've, we've polled participants and find that some people want more of me speaking and some people want more of open group discussion and some people want more of breakouts. 
And there's only so much you can do in the space of a 90 minute session. I would love to consult with you on that. Uh, some, people obviously. Longer, some people want shorter. Yeah, yeah, what, I yeah, want, yeah. what I want is a meaningful conversation that moves worlds. That's what I want. And it's looking at how do we design that. I'll be doing yeah. this the third Wednesday of every month. I'll, I'll, I'll flash an invite to you. Um, Jerry, I'd love to debrief with you offline and, and see how, that, how it was for you and what you observed. And um, Jerry had to leave. Oh, Jerry's gone. Okay, well, I'll get. I'll, I know where to find him. <laughs> yes. Thank. Thank you, George. You still, look, you still look curious, even though you're on camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Exactly. But I'd be happy to 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 uh, get involved in that. I just love group dynamic stuff and helping groups get the way they want to go. Thank you. I will introduce myself very shortly. Um, my name is Mark. I am an employee at the Internet Archive. I am on disability, um, uh, healed from uh, lymphoma. Um, from uh, I live in the inner sunset and was able to walk to uh, the cancer infusions. Um, I'm basically an epistemologist in the Gregory Bateson mode. Um, in 1984, I started writing down what I hear and uh, linking those Mm, utterance objects in a DOS program that I wrote myself. And at the moment, I've got 2.4 million unique text strings with 14 million associations among them. I think of this as an infinite mind or infinite language game. And uh, basically, um, it's a way to gather a lot of utterances exceedingly quickly and easily. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to collaborate with people to make it a, a group um and one of my uh does it have links between them yes but they're but they're single value links there's no when you link cat to dog there's no um triple um that that determines the relationship because that relationship is possibly infinite um so it's a more poetic form of artificial um intelligence or artificial intelligence representation have you looked at rome research I have, and I'm good friends with, uh, um, what's his name? <laughs> Connor? Connor, yeah. Um, Connor White Sullivan. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited about that uh, technology. That I've been using Rome for about six months now. It's, it's transformed my life. I'm glad to hear that. Um, certainly two-way links, um, as uh, Ted Nelson said, are, are the key. One-way links are, are, not, are not great. Anyway, um, that's the basics. And uh, you know, I dipped my toe in the OGM, um, but, uh, you know, fatigue and, and healing, um, and I'll try to be back. Um, hi to Ken. Hi to John. That's the best of luck. Hey, Mark. Thanks so much. I, I just cool. wanted, Mark, I just wanted to ask, um, you were, at the very beginning, you were talking about the Internet Archive as being, is that sort of your day job? Or that is the, that is the hobby I have that basically, um, gets me enough money to, um, you know, study. Um, and uh, I just donated 13 boxes of books. Um, I've been going through thousands of books to uh, donate hundreds. And uh, boy, is that releasing mm -hmm. very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in talking to you more about both of those endeavors. I, I'm I, I was almost going to have to leave the call, but then I thought, oh, Mark's introducing himself. I want to find out about him. And I'm really glad I stuck around because I'm, I'm very interested in connecting with you on, on both the here, here. Great to meet the you. Internet Archive side yeah. and the, the utterances you know, <laughs> connection side. The art that I try to do is create a situation where somebody is able to emerge their own perception of the beauty and complexity and non-duality of their own minds. Um, not, to, not to basically preach, but to somehow um, present this uh, pre-association processor and develop someone's experience of their own thinking, of their own mind, and deepen that somehow. Uh, not easy and certainly don't make any money at it, but uh, um, life work. I think we've reached a time when in human history where 
technology and values and all kinds of things have combined in order to, you know, there, there, are, there are three concepts that really held us back tremendously. The whole idea of intelligence, native intelligence, the whole idea of talent, and the whole idea of content knowledge, piling stuff into our heads, which we once had to do because that was the only alternative. It's um, the flow. It is. I mean, it is yeah, exactly. They, exactly. It is so how that they flow, it's not how they stay. Yeah. So that now I think there's a potential for every human being, I don't know, above a certain brain function, above normal, you know, maybe high normal brain function. There's a, there's a, a potential for everybody to be a da Vinci or to be a Beethoven or to be a Bucky Fuller or to be, you know, and I'm including, I, I mean, I once had a plumber who was the most ingenious, Maybe. inventive guy I've ever met in my life, probably. He's he was a plumber, but he could improvise anything. He turned it into a, he turned into a handyman. Yeah. He, he could good. repair and, and anything. Begill, what you're saying? I'm sorry. So um, we're now re realizing the, the potential of putting these things together. Now, right on this call, we have what, 200, 300 years of experience. How do you harness that? How do you put it together without just putting ideas into a Cuisinart? You know, there's the whole idea of thought processing, which can be very constructive and very, very pureeing. <laughs> Um, uh, again, uh, as I get uh, uh, um, some uh, anti-fatigue back, um, uh, I hope to uh, I'll participate more often. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, um, I'll just say um, firstname.lastname at gmail.com is uh, my uh, email address. Uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. Thanks, everyone. Again, good to see John Kelly, a uh, good friend and, and Ken, a new friend, and uh, to meet uh, newer friends, Michael, George, Lisa, Stacey. Bye-bye now. Bye -bye. Good There's to see you all. Take care. Bye, everybody. Ciao.